Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mayor Paulette Wajardo. And I wanna start by thanking our city, county, public health district employees for working hard throughout this pandemic. I want you to know that your efforts have not gone unnoticed by me or by your city council. And I undoubtedly support all of you as we navigate through this current transition. So thank you again for your service. As of Monday, November the 1st, the health district has administered 165,239 COVID-19 vaccines. That breaks down to over 90,000 first doses, over 68,000 second doses, over 4,000 third doses, and a little over 2,000 boosters. The vaccination rate in Nueces County for the 12 years and above age group is at 60.9%. In total for Nueces County, there are 184,965 residents that are fully vaccinated. This number reflects residents vaccinated through our health district and other providers as well. And with that said, yesterday afternoon, the CDC advisory panel recommended the Pfizer vaccine for the age group five through 11 years of age. As of today, that recommendation for the Pfizer vaccine was approved by the CDC. Our health district is prepared to administer these vaccines for this age group, which you'll hear from Annette Rodriguez uh, shortly, and she'll tell you a little bit more information about that. But the health district has received 9,900 pediatric Pfizer vaccines just yesterday and have them available at all health district sites free of charge. And if you would like to vaccinate your child with the Pfizer vaccine, a parent will need to be present and give written and verbal consent. So please know that staff also at all health district vaccine sites are trained to answer your questions and to help you make informed decisions on these vaccinations. If you're looking to get your first, second, or booster vaccine, there are numerous clinics continue, that are continued to be available to you. La Palmera Mall, which is our busiest location, is available. Our Greenwood uh, Senior Center, Physicians West in front of the old Memorial Hospital, the County Courthouse, and of course here at City Hall, right down the hallway here, right outside of council chambers in my office. You can also receive your free, free vaccine at the former Nike store at the outlets of Corpus Christi Bay in Robstown. And for any additional information on these locations, you can visit cctexas.com and click the tab, Upcoming COVID-19 Vaccination Clinics. As a reminder, if you would like to receive your second or booster vaccine, please have your vaccination card available to present to the medical personnel. And if you were vaccinated through the health district but do not have your card, health district employees can provide a replacement card for you. So I want to end by thanking all residents who've chosen to receive this life-saving vaccine. While the infection rates are decreasing, it is still very important that we remain vigilant in regards to protecting yourself and others against COVID-19. So we will now have a brief translation from Gabby, and then we will hear from our director, Annette Rodriguez. Quiero agradecer al Distrito de Salud Pública de la Ciudad y el Condado por trabajar arduamente y hacer disponibles las vacunas para todos los residentes que decidan vacunarse. En cuanto a estadísticas, las vacunas administradas a partir del 1 de noviembre, o sea, de este lunes, han sido 165,239 dosis, o sea, más de 90,000 en las primeras dosis, 68,544 en la segunda dosis y 4,033 refuerzos. La población mayor de 12 años tiene una tasa de vacunación del 60.9%. Actualmente son 184,965 los residentes que están completamente vacunados. La meta es lograr entre el 70 y el 80% de la población elegible que esté completamente vacunada. Ayer, los Centros para el Control de Enfermedades, o CDC, aprobaron la vacuna Pfizer para niños entre 5 a 11 años en una dosis menor. 
si desea vacunar a su hijo con la vacuna Pfizer, un padre debe estar presente y dar su consentimiento por escrito y verbalmente. Si usted tiene preguntas sobre las vacunas de refuerzo y desea saber si usted ya puede, uh, puede obtener una, puede hacer esa pregunta en cualquiera de las clínicas. El personal está capacitado para responder a sus preguntas. Existen actualmente siete vacu clínicas de vacunación. Estas son en el Centro Comercial La Palmera, el Centro para Adultos Mayores Greenwood, Physicians West frente al antiguo Hospital Memorial, la Corte del Condado de Nueces, aquí mismo en el ayuntamiento, en el primer piso afuera de la alcaldía, así como en la antigua tienda Nike en, el, en los ex outlets de Corpus Christi en Robstown. Si desea conocer los horarios y más información sobre estos lugares, visite cctejas.com y haga clic en la pestaña Próximas Clínicas de Vacunación. Recuerde, si está buscando recibir su segunda vacuna o la de refuerzo, traiga su tarjeta de vacunación si es que la tiene con usted. Asegúrese de usar su cubrebocas cuando sea apropiado y vacúnese si aún no lo ha hecho. Thank you. Annette Rodriguez, director. I'm going to start out with the COVID-19 statistics for you. And on the first slide, you're going to see for the last two weeks, you're going to see some uh, dates that don't have any numbers in there. And that's because those are the weekends. And so we're allowing our staff, while we're kind of in a lull right now, to uh, have some weekends off. So the numbers, if you look at last week on that far side of the screen, those were 289 COVID cases in New Oasis County. And then this past week, the numbers increased to 367. So we continue to watch these numbers very carefully, especially as we go into our winter months and we go into um, the holidays. This next slide is uh, the pie diagram that basically shows a cumulative number of cases divided out by those that have recovered. Uh, at the bottom of the donut uh, shape um, graph, 65,008 have recovered. The active cases, 787. And then 1267 uh, is the deaths for a total of 67,062 cases of COVID-19 here in Nueces County since the beginning in March of 2020. The hospitalizations uh, for COVID-19 patients, if, as you can see on this slide, uh, the graph looks like it's coming down. So 76 on one end, 54 on the other end. Again, disregard the zeros because it was not zero. It's just those numbers were not reported over the weekend. If you look at that last week, it was 356 patients hospitalized versus this past week, 296 patients hospitalized. So now hospitalizations are, are going down. So that's a really good trend that we're happy to see. Next slide, if you look at the ICU patients, we're seeing a very similar trend and I think it's kind of easy to see from 45 down to 28 patients that are still hospitalized in the ICU uh, needing additional care for COVID-19, but the numbers are uh, um, uh, dropping and uh, the number of deaths also are decreasing as well. So again, a very good sign. The total number of individuals that have lost their life to COVID-19 uh, is 1,267 people here in Nueces County. We did have one death today. It was a female in her early 40s uh, with no comorbidities that, that we could see on the chart. And my deepest condolences go out to uh, the family that lost this individual. For the fatalities, if you look again, we have a downward trend. So last week, that total is 17 deaths. And this past week was eight deaths due to COVID-19. Let's discuss uh, what's going on with COVID-19 vaccines. So public health continues to work hard in our community as we work towards reaching our goal of vaccinating everyone who's eligible. The health district has administered over 164,000 vaccines, as you heard the mayor mention, resulting in 61% of the eligible population fully vaccinated in Nueces County. I know many parents 
pediatricians and physicians have been eagerly awaiting the vaccines for younger children to arrive. And I'm happy to report, as the mayor mentioned, we did receive our Pfizer uh, pediatric vaccines yesterday. And the news that CDC approved the recommendation that children ages 5 to 11 can now receive the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine at a smaller dose. The CDC director, as well as the Department of State Health Services, has also approved us beginning to give those vaccines out. And the health district has started administering these pediatric vaccines as of today. So we're at all seven vaccination sites, and I know that uh, the mayor mentioned them as well, but they're up on the screen. So please, if you're close to La Pomera Mall, it used to be the Old Charming Charlies, uh, Physicians West, which is right across from Memorial Hospital, Greenwood Senior Center, which is, which is right next door to the Health Department, Noises County Courthouse, everybody knows where the courthouse is, as well as City Hall, but also the outlet malls at the old Nike store in Robstown were there as well. And so please, if you're in one of those locations and you're wanting a vaccine, um, by all means, stop by. It's very simple and it's free. The CDC actually reported that 745 children under 18 years of age have died due to COVID-19. Tragically, COVID-19 is among the top 10 leading causes of death for children 5 through 11 years of age in the United States. The chance that a child will have a severe COVID-19 or require hospitalization or develop a long-term complication like multi-inflammatory syndrome for children remains low, but still the risk remains. The risk versus the benefits of vaccinating this age group must be made by their parents. By now, I think most, if not everyone has heard, boosters are available for all three COVID-19 vaccines. So I'm gonna start with the easy one. So for J&J, &J, everyone 18 years and older who has received J&J &J vaccine is eligible to get a booster dose at least two months after they receive that first dose. There is no other criteria, criteria for receiving your J&J &J booster other than the time period. At least two months after your first dose, you can get your booster. And so if you look at this slide, the J&J &J is at the bottom. If you need a booster, you can come over to the right-hand side and you can get either a J&J &J as your booster or you can get, it has to be t at least two months after, you can get your Pfizer as a booster or you can get the Moderna as a booster, even if you had your J&J &J as your initial dose. So let's talk about the Pfizer and the Moderna, the mRNA recipients. Certain groups of people can now get their boosters for those two uh, vaccines. These individuals are those 65 years and older, as well as people 18 years and older who live in a long-term care facility, or if they have underlying health conditions, or are at re increased risk of social inequities, or live or work in a high risk setting that makes them eligible to receive the booster dose six months after receiving their second dose. So here's how this one goes. So on the far right hand side, you see dose number one and you see either Pfizer or Moderna. So you have to get, it's a two dose series. So you go to the second dose, there's Pfizer on the top. It's 21 days after your first dose, you get your second dose. Below it is Moderna. So it's 28 days after you get your first dose, you get your second Moderna series. You're done with your series. Now you're needing to get a booster dose. So you have to wait at least six months from your second dose. That's at the top, at least six months. You can wait seven or eight months, but at least six months. And then you go over to the right side of this slide and you can decide which vaccine you're wanting to get as your booster. Do you want another Moderna? because you got two Modernas, or do you want a Pfizer mixed with your Moderna, or do you want a J&J? &J? And so uh, those are your options. So now, what's on the horizon? So uh, there's a fourth dose of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine that was approved for only those individuals who are immune compromised. These individuals include people with HIV AIDS, 
cancer transplant patients who are taking certain immunocompromising drugs or those with inherited diseases that affect the immune system. If you're not sure if you're an immune compromised individual, speak to your physician. They can let you know. So this fourth dose will be available six months after receiving your third dose for those individuals. Remember, third doses were just recently approved on August, 20, on August 12th of 2021. So no fourth doses should be given out until February of 2022. This information is just for future consideration if you are immunosuppressed and would like to receive a fourth dose. So we could go back to the slide with the, there you go, so thank you. So if you received your dose one and dose two, you received Pfizer or you received Moderna and you've got both of those and you are immunocompromised, so you're taking some type of drugs like chemotherapy that causes you to be immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, then you go down to the third dose, the additional dose. So once you take that third dose, Six months after that date, you can go and you can get a booster. And you can choose any one as your booster. You can stay with the same uh, uh, vaccine. If you've got Pfizer, you can continue with Pfizer. If you want to switch, you can go from Pfizer. You can get one, two, three Pfizer's, and then six months later, you can get a, a Moderna or a J&J. &J. And so this is how you read this graph. I just wanted to make sure that y'all knew because we're putting that on our website. And so not everybody gets a fourth dose, only those individuals that are immunocompromised. So now I'm going to switch over for international travel. As the holidays approach, please be mindful of COVID-19 related restrictions in areas you plan to travel and take the appropriate steps to avoid delays. So, and some of those uh, appropriate steps are look at your COVID-19 vaccination card. If it doesn't have your lot numbers there, please make sure to either visit our website, www.cctexas.com, or you can actually call us at 826-7200, option two, and we can actually help you to make sure that those lot numbers are on there because many places do require the lot numbers. We have it in our system. You may not have it on your card because at the time we were trying to vaccinate with a sense of urgency, but we still have the documentation that's needed. So starting on Monday, November the 8th, 2021, fully vaccinated U.S. citizens and permanent residents returning to the United States after travel must provide a negative COVID-19 test within three days of departure to the United States. As well, within one day for those not vaccinated or not fully vaccinated. So make sure that you know, you know where you're going, but anybody coming back into the United States, if you're fully vaccinated, you're gonna need to get swabbed, you're gonna have to get tested to make sure you're negative before traveling back. And if you're not vaccinated, you have one day to get tested before you can travel back into the United States safely. In closing, the more people vaccinated, the better off our community will be in suppressing the spread of COVID-19. COVID-19 vaccines have been proven safe and effective in preventing serious illness and death. Thank you. Please do your part to stay safe over the holidays. I will now turn it over for translation and then turn it over to Dr. Chris Bird from Texas A&M. Thank you. El día de hoy se reportan 55 casos positivos, 787 casos continúan aún activos, 65,008 casos son ya recuperaciones. Se reportan hasta el día de hoy 1,267 fallecimientos. Tan solo el día de hoy fue una persona la que perdió la vida debido al COVID. 54 personas se encuentran hospitalizadas, de estas 28 se encuentran en la unidad de cuidados intensivos. Continuamos trabajando arduamente para poder vacunar a todas las personas del condado que son elegibles. Actualmente se han administrado más de 164 mil vacunas, o sea, el 61% de la población elegible. El día de ayer se aprobó la vacunación para niños de, 11, perdón, de 5 a 11 años que podrán recibir la vacuna Pfizer en una dosis más reducida. El Distrito de Salud ha recibido dosis, dosis pediátricas de Pfizer y comenzó a administrar esas vacunas hoy en los siete sitios de vacunación. Según los Centros de Control de Enfermedades, o CDC, 745 niños menores de 18 años han muerto debido al COVID-19. El COVID-19 se encuentra entre las 10 principales causas de muerte de niños de 5 a 11 años en los Estados Unidos. Los padres deben determinar los riesgos frente a los beneficios al momento de tomar la vacuna. 
Todas las personas mayores de 18 años que hayan recibido la vacuna Johnson Johnson son elegibles para recibir una dosis de refuerzo al menos dos meses después de haber recibido su primera inyección. Para quienes recibieron vacunas de Pfizer y Moderna, ciertos grupos de personas, incluidas de 65 años o más, así como las personas de 18 años o más que viven en centros de atención a largo plazo, tienen afecciones de salud o son elegibles para una dosis de refuerzo seis meses después de recibir su segunda inyección. El día de hoy se aprobó una, una cuarta dosis de la vacuna Pfizer y Moderna para aquellos que están inmunodeprimidos únicamente, incluyendo aquellas personas con VIH o SIDA, pacientes con cáncer y trasplantes que estén tomando ciertos medicamentos inmunosupresores, así como personas con enfermedades hereditarias que afectan el sistema inmunológico. Esta cuarta dosis está disponible seis meses después de recibir su tercera dosis. La tercera dosis se aprobó recientemente, el 12 de agosto, por lo que no se debe administrar una cuarta dosis hasta al menos febrero de 2022. Esta información es solo para consideración futura de recibir una cuarta dosis. Si usted no sabe si califica para una cuarta dosis, se le pide hablar primero con su médico. Para las personas que van a viajar al extranjero, revise bien las pautas de vacunación para el lugar a donde planee ir. Desde el 8 de noviembre, los ciudadanos norteamericanos y residentes legales que estén completamente vacunados deberán proporcionar una prueba COVID negativa al menos tres días antes de su regreso a los Estados Unidos o un día antes si, si aún no está vacunado. Para más información puede comunicarse al 826-7200. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Chris Bird. I'm here to speak to you on behalf of the TAMU CC Modeling and Informatics Task Force, and we're here to deliver your biweekly uh, pandemic report. We have two objectives on our uh, modeling team. The first is to address your questions, and the second is to help local leaders make good decisions. Right, first off, this looks like the CDC has caught up to us here where they announced that indeed um, vaccination induced immunity is stronger than natural immunity. We've been showing these graphics for uh, literally months now showing that, that same thing. Uh, right here on the red bar that's really high, those are the people that have been reinfected, so they've tested positive twice and they have not been vaccinated. And on the other side are the people that have been Uh, reinfected that were fully vaccinated. So if you get vaccinated, you're much less likely to get reinfected with COVID-19. And hence, uh, vaccine-induced immunity is much stronger than just natural immunity. Next, on the case counts, uh, your eyes don't deceive you. We are going up a little bit in working age people from 20 to 60. Uh, we have an increase in the number of cases from the last time that we talked. Uh, but the main purpose of this slide is to show you that the Delta wave, this, uh, this last wave that we've been in throughout the uh, tail end of the summer and going into the fall, is almost completely a phenomenon that's associated with people who have not been vaccinated. If you look at this graphic, you'll see on the right side where the people have been vaccinated, there is no peak, there's no spike, there's no wave, there's no Delta wave in vaccinated people. It's only occurred in unvaccinated people. Um, and now we're seeing a, an increase again. Okay, we, we do model projections to, uh, to parameterize the model. We fit it to the actual data. This is a graphic that shows you uh, the modeled number of weekly infections. That would be the number of people that the model thinks are getting COVID each, uh, each week. That's in the orange and in the black are the actual number of people um, that test positive for COVID and we align these together. You can see there's a very good fit of these two to each other. That's how we calibrate the model. Again, you can see the cases have leveled off and it's increasing ever so slightly right now. If we translate that uh, into the model now, the model says that the transmission rate is now 1.1. That means for every 100 people that contract COVID, they infect 110 people. And so that means that COVID is expanding and this is an acceleration that can uh, potentially keep getting faster and faster if the transmission rate stays at 1.1. There's, there's our transmission rate right now. Uh, and if we stay right where we are now, the transmission rate will remain above one for, for quite a bit of time. When we look at the number of people in the ICU, it's coming down. The black data points show you the actual number of people in the ICU each day. Uh, and the red line shows you our model projection. You can see there's a little bit more people in the ICUs right now 
uh, 42 than the model predicts. Uh, but we should see these numbers continue to come down for at least another week um, and before they may start to increase again. Uh, same thing for the inpatients, it's coming down. Uh, you can see we have 94 inpatients at last count with COVID. Uh, again, the model's predicting we should have a little bit less, uh, but one thing you'll notice when comparing these two to each other is that nearly 50% of all the people in the hospital with COVID uh, are in the ICU. And so most of the hospitalized cases are people that are having severe cases. Okay, moving on to things that uh, concern those of us that don't have COVID, like uh, will there be space for me in the hospital if I get sick or get into a car accident? And right now the vacancy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, wrong slide. So right now we're on the uh, uh, amount of uh, capacity of the hospital devoted to COVID. And this is getting low and that's good. So this is that 15% marker that we've been looking. And this is the first time since I, I came back to do these uh, pandemic updates that we've been below uh, 15%. So the last time we talked two weeks ago, we were at 18%, now we're at 7.6%. This is good. Uh, this means that there's a lot of hospital capacity that can be devoted to things other than COVID, patients other than COVID. Now, uh, what I started to talk about was the vacancy, which is still really low. Uh, and what this means is that um, there are a, about 11% of all the beds that are available for people that, that need help on top of um, the, the beds that are filled right now. And before this latest uh, Delta wave, it was about 35%. And it was 35% pretty much throughout nearly the entire pandemic. Um, so I'm not sure what's changed here, but we're right at 11% right now, vacancy in the hospitals. This can be a decision that uh, is made by administrators at the hospitals. It could represent also um, maybe that there's not as many um, FEMA workers that were, were here before, but maybe they're not with us anymore. All right, fatalities. I've been telling you for uh, several weeks now that eventually the count of fatalities is gonna catch up with the model and it looks like it has now. You can see that the model is a very good fit to the number of fatalities. Um, and the reason why it took a while for this to occur is that it takes a while to count up the fatalities because there were so many of them uh, in this Delta wave. Uh, so we're going down, but unfortunately it looks like we're expecting them to level off because that transmission rate is up again. Uh, and we're, uh, it doesn't look like we're gonna get down to zero. So we'll, we'll see how this plays out. And remember again, that uh, for at least the last two weeks, generally not all the death certificates have been counted from COVID and it takes uh, about that much time for them all to be counted. Okay, uh, I'm gonna uh, round it out here with these uh, really cutting edge graphics, but I think they cut to the, the chase in terms of what we've seen with COVID. So uh, we have a table here, the first row says uh, summer of 2020, there were 22,830 cases in that wave, that summer wave last year, and 732 fatalities in the winter wave that we had last year. There were 17,432 cases that were confirmed and 505 fatalities. Uh, and now in the summer wave of 2021, the Delta wave, we've had 22,881 cases and 719 fatalities. If you look at that, it doesn't look like wave by wave they're getting smaller. This wave that we just had was just as big in terms of fatalities and cases as the summer of 2020 wave. And this is something that concerns me looking forward and makes me wonder what our winter 21-22 uh, wave is going to look like. Hopefully it doesn't look like the winter 2021 wave. And rounding this out, uh, I'm not sure why there's an arrow in the middle of the screen, but you know, and just try to ignore that. Uh, overall, this is the number of cases and fatalities by year. And uh, your eyes don't deceive you, in 2021, we've had more cases uh, than in 2020, 35,000 versus 31,000, and 1,100 fatalities in 2021 versus 922 in 2020. And so uh, things are going in the wrong direction here. And as we're approaching the end of 2021 and going into 2022, uh, my hope is that in 2022, it looks starkly different as we move forward. And there's ways that you can help that happen there by getting vaccinated, 
thereby getting the booster shot, thereby um, wearing your masks and, and social distancing. You know, COVID is for real. And we don't know if there's gonna be another variant past Delta, the Omega variant, or whatever it might be, that's even more virulent th than this one. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we wanna do these things. So in summary, new cases are rising ever so slightly, but nonetheless, they're rising. And the thing to realize is uh, COVID doesn't stay still. The cases are either going up or they're going down. And when that transmission rate goes above one, like we talked about, it's not, um, it's not velocity. It's not just going fast. It's accelerating. It's going faster and faster and faster. Uh, and so right now we're in that phase again where we're going faster and faster and faster. Even though we might be going slow right now, we're going to be going faster tomorrow and faster the day after. And that's kind of how it sneaks up on us. So right now, if you take this seriously, it, there's a possibility we could stop any future waves from occurring by taking it seriously right now. Hospitalizations and fatalities are still declining, but we expect that those are gonna level off and maybe start to increase also. Uh, and the vacancy is still low right now compared to last year in the hospitals, but hopefully that will be improving. So first off, if you haven't been vaccinated yet, we strongly encourage you to get vaccinated. The numbers don't lie. Across the world, uh, all the data shows that getting vaccinated makes you much less likely to get COVID, to get sick from COVID, to go to the hospital from COVID, or to die from COVID. Um, so if you've been vaccinated and it's been six months, uh, if you had Moderna or Pfizer or two months since you had a Johnson & Johnson shot, get boosted, get the booster. I got boosted last Friday. I had uh, you know, a little bit of uh, sniffles and things on Saturday, but I feel good now. And uh, you know, different people have uh, different reasons for why they're doing it. Uh, my mother just had heart surgery and I'm gonna be taking care of her and she's a very fragile state. And even though I've been vaccinated before, I don't wanna take any chances that I might you know, infect her with COVID. And so that's why I got the booster so I can help her recover from her heart surgery. If you're symptomatic, self-isolate. I mean, I, I know I've talked to so many people that are out sick um, from, uh, from TAMU CC and I ask them if, if it's COVID and they say, oh no, it's not. And then I ask them, oh, so, so you got tested? And they're like, oh no, I, I just know it's not COVID. So, you know, that's not the right way to do it. Um, but at the very least they isolate it. So isolate, get tested. If you test positive immediately, uh, go and get the monoclonal antibodies, uh, contact your doctor. They can set you up with that. The monoclonal antibodies is a special thing that we have access to here in our community in the Coastal Bend that most communities don't have access to for free. We have access to it for free. Um, so you should really take advantage of that. The idea of it is it keeps you out of the hospital. It keeps you from getting as sick. Uh, and lastly, uh, if you uh, end up uh, testing negative, make sure you continue to mask up in public. It's a simple thing. <clears throat> I went into the store today to grab my lunch I wore the mask for about five minutes uh, and then I came out and I took it off. You know, no big deal, but it decreased the chances that if I did contract COVID that I would be spreading it or that I might um, contract it in that setting. Uh, and continue to social distance. And like I've noted in the past, nobody seems to have any problems with social distancing in the store. Everybody likes to space out in line from, from what I've seen. So that's good behaviors. That's gonna help us uh, avoid this next wave. So thank you very much. That's the report for this week. And as far as I know, we'll be back in two weeks to deliver another report. But if it's not in person, uh, we'll upload it online and you can view it there. Thank you. Los casos de personas que dieron positivo al virus desde el 1 de julio y no contaban con la vacuna fueron 19,564, comparado a 1,253 quienes sí contaban con la vacuna. Pacientes que fueron hospitalizados y sí contaban con la vacuna fueron 147, comparado a 946 quienes no estaban vacunados. Estas últimas cifras desde el 1 de agosto. Desde el 1 de julio han sido 34 las personas que se han reinfectado y estaban vacunadas, mientras que la reinfección de personas no vacunadas fue de 254. La variante Delta se esparció mucho más rápidamente en personas no vacunadas. Actualmente, esos casos se están nivelando. Los casos positivos están acelerando un poco. El radio de transmisión aumentó a 1.1. O sea que por cada 100 personas con el virus pueden infectar a 110 personas más. Afortunadamente, los casos de pacientes en unidades de cuidados intensivos han disminuido.
Los casos de pacientes hospitalizados en áreas generales también disminuyó considerablemente a menos del 15% del total de camas que están destinadas para pe a pacientes con COVID y ahora se encuentra en el 7.6%. El número de camas disponibles en hospitales aún es bajo. El número de, de decesos también está disminuyendo. El impacto de casos por COVID en el área de la costa es el siguiente. En el 2020 se, report, se reportaron 31,746 casos que resultaron en 922 fallecimientos, mientras que en lo que va del año se han reportado 35,127 casos positivos, resultando en 1,131 fallecimientos. Le recordamos que estas cifras son del área de la costa, incluyendo el Condado de Nueces. Se le sigue pidiendo tomar todas sus medidas de salubridad y mantener distanciamiento social. Y piensa en vacunarse si aún no lo ha hecho. ¿Tienen preguntas? No. Eso concluye nuestro briefing de hoy y nos volveremos en dos semanas. Gracias.